Deuteronomy chapter 30 this morning, and I just want to share a little bit before we begin looking at the text. It's quite obvious to us, but I think sometimes we can take it for granted that it's obvious to the world because things are constantly changing out there, the philosophies and ideas, especially in our culture. And the thing that I think is obvious is that in the world there is good and evil. And there is life and there is death. There are blessings and there are cursings, right? And that should be obvious. And most people say, yeah, there's, there's life and there's death. And no, there's no good and evil. You know, I don't believe in that or something. As if someone's belief makes it true or not. But many want to deny this obvious truth, don't they? And there needs to be a bit of facing the facts for many, I think, that there is good and evil, that there are blessings and cursings. And since man has broken the law, then man faces the charges. They say, really? I haven't broken the law. Yeah, everyone has broken the law. What law? Well, plenty of laws, first of all. God's laws. Spiritual laws that have been broken. Countless times they've been broken by everyone. And, you know, let's just start with some examples. Worshiping God alone. You know, have no other gods before me, he says. And mankind makes many gods. And mankind themselves, many people want to be God in themselves, worship themselves, ignore God. God says, love him with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength. Love your neighbor, right? Fulfilling the law and the prophets. Loving your neighbor. But mankind loves money. Mankind loves glory and uh, prominence, not serving. And anytime someone's not loving, they're breaking God's law. How often is that? And you could go into many other examples. Um, of breaking God's laws. But we're living in a world, this is interesting, where there's a real mixture. There's good in the world, there's evil in the world. There's life in the world, there's death in the world. There's plenty of wonderful, beautiful things in the world. And yet at the same time, there's tons of ugly things in the world. It's really crazy to start thinking about that. And the more you think about it, the more you, you see it. And that's actually where some people get the idea of some of the religions that are out there, like Gaia, G-A-I-A, Gaia, which has become more popular in recent time. And it's a modern religion, right? And, and it, where they believe that there's this balance of a flow of what we perceive as good and evil, but really it's not good and evil. It's just a balance. It's like the force of Star Wars, there just needs to be a balance. And anytime one side's outweighing the other, the other needs to grow a little bit more so it can bring back the balance, as it were. The Taoist religion with the famous yin and yang. Everybody's seen that, right? You know, the, the circles with the two dots in it and so forth. And I, I used to just think, well, yeah, there, there it is, good and evil. But that's not actually the case. When I began reading a little bit about it, it says that, that yin and yang is saying there's opposing forces, yes, but those opposing forces are interconnected. And they're constantly opposing, but they're constantly interdependent of one another. They complement at the, at the same time as opposing. And, and they see it as composing everything that there is. You know, they could look at the ocean and then the land. They could look at the air and then they look at another element or something, fire or whatever. You know, and they, they see all these male and female and, and, and ideas that are out there. And they just see it as the, a complementing and opposing and intertwining of everything. But they do not say it's actually good and evil. They're opposed to that idea. They, they actually say it's ultimately all good even the things we perceive as bad in the larger scheme of things are ultimately good. And I would assume maybe the evolutionist, uh, uh, Darwinistic theory would say something similar where they might think that, well, yeah, because your 
uh, chemicals and elements are going back into the ground to fuel the next generation. Besides, if you had that many people living forever, I mean, there's not enough room and so on, and they, they'd theorize scientifically why it just doesn't work, and it's not fair for you to keep living when not giving someone else in the next generation a chance to thrive or something like this. I don't know how they'd say it, because that's not my way of thinking. But the, in the larger scheme of things, it's good. Now, some have the idea of finding good in everything or believing there is good in everything, and there was a conversation that happened in the last uh, week or so with me and that this came up, which is why I'm kind of talking about it because of the Florida shootings and, and someone saying, well, and there, there's good in the world. Like, really? You ask that question. You can't tell me that's good. Tell me it's good. Just say it. I dare you. It's not good. You know, and they, and they just, they're like, well, and they'll just like go extrapolate on some craziness. It's like, that makes no sense. What are you talking about? It's just not good. Can we just stop it there? Right? Go, go tell one of the parents it's good. But some have that idea. And biblically, though, there isn't good in everything. That's just a fact. There is evil in the world. Just look up the words good and evil on one of the Bible programs on the computer. It's all over the place. It's thick and thorough through the whole Bible. In fact, Genesis, what happened? There was the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. Right there. And it's all in Revelation too. So, I mean, it's like from the beginning to the end. Biblically, there is good and biblically there is evil and there is a war. And it's amazing, though, that God can take all things and use them ultimately for the good. Doesn't mean he made the bad or that that bad is good intrinsically. It's not. Do you understand that? But he can take something that happened that man chose to do that is, that is bad and is evil, and he will ultimately use it and can use it for the good. That's how good God is. That's how amazing he is. But our perspective and attitude, um, they don't change the event or the thing, whether it's good or evil. Well, if my perspective is better, then that doesn't change that event. The event is, or the thing, or whatever you want to call it, is evil or it's good. The philosophy even is evil or good. And your attitude doesn't change that fact, but only our response to it. And we do see a contrast. The world's full of wonder, it's full of beauty, it's so full of those things, but then it, there is much pain and ugliness in this world, right? I mean, you can see a rose. My daughter drew me a beautiful rose picture this week. Dad, this is for you. I got it yesterday because I came back from the men's conference. And, and I, I noticed right away the thorns all over the, the stem of this rose. I was like, wow, those look dangerous. <laughs> you know, the rainbow is beautiful. The rain, I like how you drew this and complimented some things. And look at these thorns. The thorns are part of the curse, right? And someone say, well, the thorns are good because they protect the plant. But then you could argue back, but the very fact that the plant needs thorns <laughs> isn't good, is it? <laughs> right? Oh. So we live in this world and... There's good and there's evil. In the beginning, God saw all that he made and it was very good. Not just good, it was very good. Very good. There was no evil. There was nothing cursed. But when man chose to rebel from God and go his own way, that curse came upon the earth. Rejecting the source of all that is good and creative and beautiful, how appropriate that curse is come into the world. So we live in a world with both, and we all personally experience both, don't we? We've all experienced good. We've all experienced evil. We've all experienced blessings. We've all experienced cursings. We've all experienced life. We've all experienced, you know, not personally, we're here, but death. We've experienced that, you know, with loved ones and what have you. We've all experienced these things, and we know something is wrong 
We don't want it to remain that way. We don't like it. It's not good. It's not very good. We cannot say that anymore about all things because it's not. But yet in the world, there is beautiful, amazing things that are lovely that you can enjoy and you can glorify God over, right? Go out in the nature around us and just glorify God. Wow, look at this. This is incredible. It's just amazing, right? So, but yet there's pain and evil coexisting. We don't have to settle for good and evil coexisting in the world forever. That's awesome. We have hope. That is hope. Nor, as believers in Jesus, do we have to settle for good and evil coexisting right now inside of us. That is awesome. Because Jesus rose from the dead, conquering sin and death. We don't have to settle for good and evil coexisting in ourselves in that way of spiritually speaking. Um, so I want to share some things, really a few things, in this text of Deuteronomy chapter 30 that there's principles that are so huge. And I hope that you see them too as we study this text. And I do want to talk about what's going on with Israel in the text but I really want to talk about the bigger picture, which certainly here and Paul is going to refer to in Romans. We'll look there and so forth. So really the, uh, the first one we look at is going to be repentance. Repentance. And then we're going to look at believing and the new heart that's given in that. Just the simple way to salvation. It, it is in Deuteronomy chapter 30. It's so great. So verse 1 of Deuteronomy 30. Please turn your eyes there. Now it shall come to pass when all these things come upon you, the blessing and the curse which I have set before you, and you call them to mind among all the nations where the Lord your God drives you, and you return to the Lord your God and obey his voice. According to all that I command you today, you and your children, with all your heart and with all your soul, that the Lord your God will bring you back from captivity and have compassion on you and gather you again from all the nations where the Lord your God has scattered you. Verse 4. If any of you are driven out to the farthest parts under heaven, from there the Lord your God will gather you and from there he will bring you. Then the Lord your God will bring you to the land which your fathers possessed and you shall possess it. He will prosper you and multiply you more than your fathers. I want to pause there and talk about repentance here. That God is saying right, right away through Moses to the nation of Israel. Again, he's speaking about the future at the end of Deut- Deuteronomy of what's going to happen. They're on that plain overlooking the Jordan and they haven't entered into the promised land yet with Joshua as their commander. But they're about to and so it's the closing address. And in that The Lord is telling them through Moses that they are going to rebel. They are going to break his commandments. And we just studied blessings and cursings, blessings and cursings for the last several chapters there. Remember Mount Ebal and Mount Gerizim. So all these blessings will come upon you if you obey. All these cursings will come upon you if you do not obey. And now he says in verse 30, it shall come to pass. I mean, chapter 30, verse 1. It shall come to pass when all these things come upon you. In other words, you're going to disobey. And the, the if isn't even really a question. See, how discouraging if you had the foreknowledge of God, it might be, right? I mean, bummer. The, you, you already know what's going to happen with these guys. But he's telling them prophetically. They're about to go into the land, and they're, they're already hearing, we're going to get kicked out of it. We're going to go into it just to get kicked out of it. This is wild if you think about it. All these things are going to come upon you. You're going to experience the blessings. You're going to experience this blessed land. You're going to experience the the, the watering of it and the fruitfulness of it. And God's blessing is going to be upon that land and those people for some time. He's going to be so forbearing in taking them out of that land. He does not want them to, but they will continuously make that choice to rebel and they will be removed, and they will experience those cursings. They will experience blessings and cursings. And then they're going to be driven out of that land. They're going to be taken captive into other lands and scattered among the nations. And he says, when you call them to mind, once you're there in those nations and you return to the Lord your God, verse 2, with all your heart, 
basically, with all your soul, mind, and strength. It's loving God, right? When, you, when your heart is changed, you, when you return to him and you obey his voice, then the Lord's going to bring you back. He's going to have compassion on you. He's going to gather you from all these places. He's scattered you and from the farthest parts, and he's going to bring you back in. It's going to happen that you rebel, but he's going to bring you back in. You know, we don't have to teach what not to do to children. Uh, we have to teach what to do, because what doing, what, you know, it's not hard to just naturally want to go do something that you're not supposed to. That's, that's normal. But you have to teach how to apologize, <laughs> right? Teach what the right thing is. And there's first repentance that's needed. That's what, that's the first part. The heart returns to the Lord. Once they realize, wow, I'm a mess. This world's a mess. No matter what I do, I can't make it better. In and of myself, in and of my striving, man needs to turn to the Lord. And that's repentance. And as far as Israel goes, Matthew 24, 31, God talks about, Jesus does, when he's going to gather the elect from the four corners of the earth. He's going to gather them. And that's a fulfillment of what, is, what he's talking about here. Yes, Israel is gathering in the land currently. And God's doing a miracle, and that's part of his work. But still, there's going to be a future time as well when the Lord is going to return and gather his elect from the four corners of the earth. And Zechariah 12.10 talks about this. I will pour upon the house of David and upon the inhabitants of Jerusalem a spirit of grace and of supplication, and they shall look on me whom they have pierced. And they shall mourn for him as one mourneth for his only son and shall be in bitterness for him as one that is in bitterness for his firstborn. Talking about the end times. Talking about after the great tribulation when the Lord returns to his people and he's going to protect them in that passage against all their enemies round about them and they're going to see Jesus. The one they've crucified and they will mourn for him. And yes, there is a fulfillment of that as well when they saw him whom they pierced. They will look upon him whom they pierced, but here they will mourn for him whom they pierced. And he, they will be gathered from the four corners of the earth. God will bring them back and their hearts will be turned. And really for Israel, it's going to be a, a national repentance that is foretold, that is going to come to the people. A national repentance. Talk about revival. It's going to be incredible. That's not, not happening right now. God is possibly preparing for that and bringing his people back to the land. There will be a time of trouble before the national repentance. But for us, I'm going to bridge it now to us. That prophecy is not for the church. Gathering his elect from the four corners of the earth. That's it. We are not appointed to wrath. That's at the end of the great tribulation. He's talking about Israel. And, and people's ideas get really mixed up when they take passages that are for Israel and they replace Israel with the church. It messes them up in Romans. It messes up people theologically in Revelation. When you replace Israel with the church, it messes things up theologically. It doesn't work. And all of a sudden you're like, wait, is it a time of peace Jesus comes back? Is it a time of war Jesus comes back? There seems to be, what's going on here? It's, it really doesn't work because it's not true. It's, when it says Israel... He's talking about Israel. Talking about his church. He's talking about his church. But anyway, um, the principle of repentance is for us, and it's for everyone. Mark 1, 14 and 15, Jesus came preaching the gospel of the kingdom of God and saying, the time is fulfilled and the kingdom of God is at hand. Repent and believe in the gospel. Jesus preached repentance. He preached repent and believe in the gospel. Luke 24 46 to 47, he said to them, Thus it is written, and thus it was necessary for Christ to suffer and to rise from the dead the third day, and that repentance and remissions, a remission of sins should be preached in his name to all nations, beginning at Jerusalem. Part of the Great Commission, but in Luke's gospel. Repentance is to be preached to all the nations. To all nations. Repentance and forgiveness of sins available. In Acts 3.19 
Peter's preaching, repent, therefore, and be converted that your sins may be blotted out so that times of refreshing may come from the presence of the Lord. It's like a dry wilderness out there, uh, sun-scorched land until there's repentance. And coming to the Lord, there's times of refreshing from his presence. Repentance is part of the gospel, and in that it's a change of heart and mind. Now, we could say repent to people today in our culture, and a lot of people might not understand it, or they're going to immediately write you off. You could just tell them to change the heart and mind. It's the same thing, okay? It's just a, it's another word that's used. And my point in saying all this is there's a stigma with repentance that maybe it's not necessarily, but maybe it is. It's, it's not a work or an action. Okay, I repent, I will go to church. No, it, as much as it is a turning from the will of self to the will of God. It's turning from a reliance in the heart to the reliance on Christ. That's repentance. And we do it all the time. And it's, it's just a process, really. Turning from rejecting God to accepting him. Turning from unbelief to belief is the thing. It's a turning. It's a change of heart. A change of mind. And that's what's going on with Israel if we look at Deuteronomy 30. And you return to the Lord your God and obey his voice. According to the law of command you today, verse 2. And you and your children and all, with all your heart, with all your soul. There's going to be repentance. That's what the Lord's saying. And when there is, I'm bringing you right into all my blessings. They're all going to be yours. But this thing has to happen in the heart first. It, it, and it's a submission. It's, it, you know what it is uh, in, in the epistles? It's turning from establishing your own righteousness to accepting the righteousness that's available by the grace of God in Christ. If you're establishing your own righteousness through religion, through good works, through some other moral code, through something, or just pure human pride, establishing your own righteousness, you need to repent of that, turn from that, and, and count that as nothing and accept the righteousness that Jesus has for us. That's repentance. It's submitting to him. And it's available by faith, his righteousness. And he gives a new heart. Let's look at verse 6 now. We'll read verse 6 through 10. And the Lord your God will circumcise your heart and the heart of your descendants to love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul that you may live. Also the Lord your God will put all these curses on your enemies and on those who hate you, who persecute you, and you will again obey the voice of the Lord and do all his commandments which I command you today. The Lord your God will make you abound in all the work of your hand and the fruit of your body and the increase of your livestock and the produce of your land for good. For the Lord will again rejoice over you for good as he rejoiced over your fathers. If you obey the voice of the Lord your God to keep his commandments and his statutes which are written in the, this book of the law, and if you turn to the Lord your God with all your heart, and with all your soul, a turning with all of the heart and all of the soul, and the Lord circumcises the heart, and you're able to do. Oh, that they would have in them a heart that can do the commandments. Oh, that they would have in them a heart and a mind to obey. The prophets cry out that God's people would have such a heart. And that heart comes by turning to the Lord in faith. He does this supernatural work in the heart, creating the new man. Now, as far as Israel goes, the law couldn't save anyone. The law can't save an Israelite. The law can't save anybody. It cannot save. But it can reveal the need for salvation, right? Romans 8.3 says, For what the law could not do, in that it was weak through the flesh, the law required human effort, and human effort is unable. Therefore, the law is weak because of human flesh, because man, is, man has to do their part of that covenant, and we can't. So Romans 8.3, again, for what the law could not do in that it was weak through the flesh, God did by sending his own son in the likeness of sinful flesh on account of sin, he condemned sin in the flesh. 
Romans 10 tells us that for Christ is the end of the law for righteousness to everyone who believes. Righteousness doesn't come through trying to keep the law. Righteousness comes through Christ. And righteous living and righteous expression through our lives. And his commands are righteous. His commands are righteous. It's that man without Christ isn't righteous. And therefore can't really fulfill the spirit of his law. The heart of his law. You can try to keep the letter. Paul says, according to the law, the letter of the law is blameless. Well, then why wasn't Paul righteous? Good question. Because righteousness doesn't come through keeping the law. It can't. Of course, he talks about when the commandment came, sin revived and I died. He realizes, no, he, he can't do it. But Christ is the end of the law for righteous to everyone who believes. And we create our own legalistic things or our own ideas of what makes us feel righteous. But it's got to be only Christ, church. Only Jesus makes us righteous. And that is, there's such freedom in that because it's, it's through faith in Christ that we're given righteous. He who knew no sin became sin for us that we might become what? The righteousness of God in Christ. That is awesome. We have been given righteousness on our account. You, you can't earn it. You can't buy it. You can't get it. There's nowhere you could possibly attain such righteousness. And we are given it freely through faith in Christ. What a gift. We get to be in God's presence because of the righteousness imputed to us. We get to stand before holy angels because of righteousness imputed to us. We, we get to judge and over nations and even angels, fallen ones, because of righteousness imputed to us. We get to rule and reign as joint heirs with Christ. And all of it is, is right. It's just that we will be in that place because... We are given this awesome righteousness. It's so amazing. I mean, I, I worked at one point with um, medical offices when we would go into cities and we would have to rent large hotels. And we would have to, uh, me and a couple of my brothers, uh, hospitals would go on strike and we were replacing hospitals, 1,000 nurse hospitals, right? And so we're flying in tons of nurses. It's a huge operations program. And so the file cabinets we'd move in, and, and one, one time, one of my jobs, part of that company, was to help files, just filing. Filing all the, the, you know, you need a state certificate for the nurses and all these other things. And boy, I remember imagining at one point, because I was born again, and I was all excited about the Lord. And I remember thinking, all these files, all these tons and tons and tons, like I'm literally surrounded by files. I think about my sin and like there's things I've done that I don't even, I'm not even aware of, right? I'm not even conscious that I sinned, but I have. And file cabinets full of whatever it is. You know, this file cabinet says, Cam's a thief. You, would you like exhibit A? No, actually we just don't need an A through Z, you know, uh, Category we need to involve numbers uppercase and lowercase too because we need it we need a lot more going on you know or or would you like to see this file cabinet or this one or something the blood of Christ washes it all away there's not a thing in those cabinets there's not a piece of paper that has my name and a sin attached to it anywhere and for all you in Christ it's exactly the same we are so set free by the blood of Christ that we become white as snow, and we're given righteousness. Instead, the devil brings an accusation, and a foul camera gets open, say, this is, of course, totally figurative, and it opens up, Cameron's righteous. That's what it says. The blood of Christ has been applied to that man, and he is righteous, he is righteous, he is righteous, he is righteous, he is righteous. And you could go forever into your past. You could go into your future. You are righteous in Christ. Praise God for that. You've got to be born again, though. If a person's not born again, then they're doomed. There's no hope without Christ. So John chapter 3 tells us that 
Jesus is speaking to a righteous man according to the law, according to his behavior, but he needs the righteousness of God in Christ still. His name is Nicodemus, and, and he's a God-fearing man. He's an obedient man to the law. He's a man that has desire in his heart, but he still needs to be born again. He still needs forgiveness. We all need it. And Jesus says to him, most assuredly in verse 5, I say to you, unless one is born of water and the Spirit, he cannot enter the kingdom of God. That which is born of the flesh is flesh. That which is born of the Spirit is spirit. Do not marvel. I say you must be born again. You must be born again, he tells him. Are you not a teacher in the law and right? You don't know these things. He needs to be born again. He needs a new heart. And Jesus isn't saying, Nicodemus, repent. No, but you know what he's telling him? Nicodemus, change the way you're thinking. You, he's telling him to repent for all argument's sake. I really believe that in John 3. And Nicodemus does have a change of heart and a change of mind. Of course, with Joseph of Arimathea taking that body of Christ, Jesus met him and, and talks to him about his need to be born again, and that need is for all. And Deuteronomy 30 presents that need for a circumcised heart, which is something that happens when God forgives us in Christ. We become one with him. The Holy Spirit's given to us. And the heart of stone, as Ezekiel puts it, is taken out of us and a heart of flesh is put into us. The carnalness, the sin is carved off of the heart. A circumcision of the heart, a cutting away of that which is not of him. And, and, a, and a, in bringing to life, God brings life and he brings life into what was once dead. And we are revived. We are born again. Now look at, so a new heart is needed. Look at verse 11, and we'll read through verse 14. For this commandment which I command you today is not too mysterious for you, nor is it far off. It's not in heaven that you should say, who will ascend into heaven for us and bring it to us that we may hear, and, uh, hear it and do it? Nor is it beyond the sea that you should say, who will go over the sea and, <laughs> for us and bring it to us that we may hear it and do it? We may want it, but people think it's so hard to get. Who's going to go get it for us? Like, how is this going to happen? Verse 14, but the word is very near you in your mouth and in your heart that you may do it. Now, that in itself sounds mysterious. What are we talking about, Moses? He's saying it's not mysterious. It's, it's right there. It's with you. What is the availability of the new life in Christ. The availability of righteousness through faith, which Abraham had and looked forward to the Messiah who would die for his sins, whom David did trust in, that he is my shield and my fortress, and he is my righteousness, and he looked forward to, and that we look back to. The availability of a new heart through God's Messiah, Jesus Christ. It's not far away. It's not hidden from you. We, we know in our heart what is right. God's commandments aren't hidden either. God's law is not hidden from mankind. All are guilty. And his law is not hidden. All have a conscience. All have a witness through God's creation that there is a creator and they stand accountable to him and everybody knows intrinsically there is right and there is wrong and people can babble all the day about the yin and yang or whatever else, but there is right and wrong and they know it. They know it. And I tell you, when you talk to somebody, and I need a reminder of this, speak to the will. Speak to that. You can argue apologetics and religion all day. Speak to the will. You can just, you know there's right and wrong in your heart. And it's like, here's what you're doing. You are banging a bell, which they have tried to wrap so many claws of religious rags or whatever else, pseudo knowledge around, and it's all being unwrapped and you hit that bell. It's called their conscience, which God's given every man and it will ring true inside their soul. That they know there is a right and they know there is a wrong. It's written in the heart. It's understandable that all man is guilty before God. 
It's understandable that we have a desire for more and don't want to die. It's understandable that man needs, mankind needs hope. The suicide rates in the youth, the, the, the terrible things going on in the States and elsewhere, they need hope. They are so hopeless. There's no reason to live. And they need hope. That's a desire and a need inside mankind's soul. Salvation, the desperate need, and the un, it's available. That's what I want to put over verse 11 through 14. God's available. The gospel's available. The truth is available. It's available. It's understandable, too. It's not too mysterious for us. It's not too mysterious for you. It's not hidden away somewhere. The desperate need for salvation isn't some mysterious thing. It's just, it's plain reality all the time. God hasn't hidden himself, the reality of God. God doesn't exist. What are you talking about? The reality of God, he has not hidden himself in some kind of obscurity. It's so hard to find the will of God. No, it's not. The Bible says in many places, this is the will of God. I don't know what to do about the will of God in this situation, Pastor. It's the will of God. Abstain from sexual morality. It's just right there in your Bible. This is the will of God. Believe on him whom he sent. It's right there in your Bible. Like, my point being, here's a text God telling ancient Israel, he's living under the law. It's not too mysterious. We have Christ in his spirit, and we live in a day where those who don't know Christ have access to the knowledge of the gospel. They have creation. They have their own conscience as witness. But the word of God is available. James Chapman researched and compiled a list of the 10 most read books in the world. And, and I always kept hearing these, like, okay, maybe the Quran's read more because there's a lot of Muslims. And blah, blah, blah. Wow. It's interesting to study. In fact, the Bible leads the countdown by a large margin, quote, with nearly 4 billion copies printed and sold globally in the last five decades. Nearly 4 billion copies of the Bible printed and sold in the last four decades. 40 years. Five, sorry, it says. Five decades. Quotations from the works of Mao Zedong, Tung, I guess, was number two with 820 million copies. Four billion copies... The next greatest published book was the quotations and works of Mao Zedong at 820 million. 820 million. Someone do the math. I think that's, I mean, obviously it's less than a fifth. <laughs> Harry Potter series was next. 400 million. Amazing. I mean, Pilgrim's Progress used to be the published book, right? Harry Potter's the third most printed and sold book. Lord of the Rings with 100 million, and it's just down from there. The Economist ran an article that was interesting, and it noted many things in it. I'll just quote one. Yet over 100 million, and this is about the Quran versus the Bible, over 100 million copies of the Bible are sold or given away every year. Annual Bible sales in America are worth between 425 and 650 million. Gideon's International gives away a Bible every second. That's just awesome. Thank you, Lord, for those Gideons, right? The Bible is available all or in part in, listen to this, 2,426 languages, covering 95 plus percent of the world's population. The Economist, the magazine, not Christian, published that. The Bible is available. God hasn't hidden himself. You, you don't have to travel out to space like it says here. Who's going to ascend into heaven and bring it to us that we may hear and do it? Go out to some echo chamber and be silent. Hear your own thoughts. What's the newest thing? Floating pools lately or whatever? I pulled up next to a car yesterday and this guy had this amazing Elvis hair and I'm like okay interesting look at his car and it said like float something or whatever and I'm like <laughs> right okay D D 
Yeah, and you know, it might be okay. Like, honestly, I, there's a lot of noise in my house and a lot of stuff. I'm like, it's just like, be quiet for a little bit. Desensory, de -sens sensory deprivation tank. So you go to this space and you get in your own little sensory deprivation tank. I think it'd be a little bit more out there, right? And you're going to find God. You're going to find an answer, you know, and bring it back to earth. You're going to go over the sea and we're going to go to Tibetan temple and we're going to find some monk who's going to teach us how to chant something we don't understand anyways. We're going to find the guru on the high hill in India. We're going to go traveling. We're going to go somewhere. We're going to go across the sea to try to get answers. Man is on this desperate search, and all along, it's near you. The word is very near you, verse 14, in your mouth and in your heart that you may do it. And that's true for everybody. Romans 10, Paul refers to this, verses 6 through 10. I'm going to turn there if you'd like to. Go ahead. Romans chapter 10, verses 6 to 10. Paul is referring directly to this passage in Deuteronomy. And he says, well, in 10.4, that's where he says, Christ is the end of the law for righteous to everyone who believes. And then in Romans 10.6, he says, but the righteousness of faith speaks this way. Do not say in your heart who will ascend into heaven. That is, and he interprets this, to bring Christ down from above, to bring us our Messiah, the messenger, the one who has salvation for us, right? Who will ascend into heaven? Or, verse 7 of Romans 10, who will descend into the abyss that is to bring Christ up from the dead? But what does it say? The word is near you in your mouth and in your heart. That is the word of faith which we preach. That if you confess with your mouth the Lord Jesus and believe in your heart that God has raised him from the dead, you will be saved. For with the heart one believes unto righteousness and with the mouth confession is made unto salvation. And whoever believes on him will not be put to shame. Whoever, Jew or Greek, of any, anybody, who, everyone has a heart that can believe. Everyone has this spiritual faculty called faith. Everybody. And they can use it or not. And everybody believes in something ultimately, right? You know, everybody does. Everybody believe, some of them, I believe in nothing. Well, you believe in your belief of nothing. That's ridiculous. But you, everybody believes in something. You're believing something. And the gospel of Jesus Christ is the help the world needs, and it's available. It's available. He's available. God's available. He's made himself available, and the whole world will be without excuse. See why? No one will be making some excuse. Well, God, you never sent someone to me. Oh, I never heard it, or this or that, and I have all these excuses. No one has to go through some difficult experience, some effort and striving and some sort of ability to have an ability to climb the seven mountains, to sail the seven seas, to get the, the seven golden trumpets or something and somehow find the answer and there it was in Aladdin's cave or whatever it is. There's no, there's no mystery. It's not hidden. It's not hidden to mankind. Isn't that loving of God and righteous of God? That righteousness is available through faith. And everyone can simply believe. It's very near. Very, very near. I just think that's amazing. Think about that. The message of righteousness by faith, the message of the gospel of being, how to be saved is right there with everyone as far as the ability to receive that. It's understandable as well. It's understandable. People need a savior. Are you going to die one day? What happens when you die? And they have these ideas. That's hopeless. Just say that. Tell them there's hope. The gospel is for the whole world, for whosoever. And it's available to us and our neighbors. And last week it was really interesting because if you look back in Deuteronomy and look at verse 29 of chapter 29, just previous to chapter 30 there, the secret things belong to the Lord our God, but those things which are revealed belong to us and to our children forever that we may do all the words of this law. And we talked about, uh, you know, how there's mysteries. There's the mystery of the rapture, the mystery of the church. There's mystery of Israel. There's all these mysteries. 
that are spoken about in the Bible. And many are revealed to us. And there are going to be mysteries that aren't revealed to us. We don't know. But the gospel was veiled until Christ. And the veil, 1 Corinthians 3, is taken away in Christ. Oh, I, don't, I just don't get it. Believe and you will. Start walking and you will. Honestly, there is something to that. Faith does come by hearing and hearing by the word, but it was explained to me once, kind of like, I'm like, well, what about this thing? Or how do I? Well, it's like holding a lantern, not a flashlight, and I need to take a step. And when I take a step, I can see just that much further. I take a step, I can see that much further. I don't know how God's going to do certain things that I believe he's promised me or what have you, but as I walk in him, I know Christ. The mysteries, many mysteries are unveiled in Christ, but a blindness does lay on the hearts of mankind. We've got to pray. Prayer is very important for souls. Praying for people. Praying that their hearts would be unveiled, their eyes. Jesus came in unstopped eyes, or unstopped ears and opened eyes. Jesus does that. Preach Jesus and, and tell people about Jesus. Jesus still un, opens people's ears and eyes. Right? He does. He's opened yours. But it's, it's, the gospel is not a secret. And Billy Graham just passed away, right? 100 years. Well, 99, 1918 to 2018. And he preached the gospel. Now, there's things people can say about him or whatever, but I tell you, he preached the gospel many, 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 many times to many, 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 many people. Okay? And, and the, the gospel has been put out there and is continuing to be put out there. And you can hate the internet, but there's some great things on the internet, too. There's, um, I went to a missions conference and heard a guy speaking about how they're putting the gospel out on the internet. You know, got questions? Dot com, I think? They just, boom, present the gospel. Uh, 2020 Vision, I think, is one. And they've just got all these websites. And they just put it out there. It's just the gospel. It's not attached to a denomination. It's not attached to anything. It's just the gospel. Global Evangelism Outreach, I believe it's called. It's just amazing. And, and they can track the hits that they have, and they're putting it out in all the countries. And uh, when they showed us, they showed us live up on the screen what was going on. And I was just going, wow, this is amazing. Global media outreach. Maybe that's what it's called. Global media outreach. But the gospel is available. So let's, let's look at the last few verses of the chapter, 15 through 20, in chapter 30 of Deuteronomy. See, I have sent before you today... Life and good. Now imagine this. You're sitting at a banquet table and it's set before you. Life and good, death and evil. In that I command you today to love the Lord your God, to walk in his ways and to keep his commandments, his statutes and his judgments, that you may live and multiply. And the Lord your God will bless you in the land which you go to possess. But if your heart turns away so that you do not hear, People do not hear because they will not hear. They do not hear because they will not hear. If your heart turns away so that you do not hear and you are drawn away, and James tells us you're drawn away by your own desires, it's the fault of a person's own desire, right? And enticed, gives birth to sin. And you're drawn away, itching ears, sinful desires, the flesh, the world, the devil, I've got to find where we're at here. Verse 17, And worship other gods and serve them. I announce you to you today that you shall surely perish. It's going to happen. There's a reality of heaven and hell. There's a reality of eternal state for all mankind. You shall not prolong your days in the land which you cross over the Jordan to go in and possess. Verse 19 and 20, watch this. I call heaven and earth as witness to you uh, today against you, that I have set before you life and death, blessing and cursing. Therefore, choose life, that both you and your descendants may live, that you may love the Lord your God, and that you may obey his voice, and that you may cling to him, for he is your life and the length of your days, and that you may dwell in the land which the Lord swore to your fathers, to Abraham, to Isaac, uh, Abraham, Isaac, uh, and Jacob, to give them. They have that unconditional land promise for them. But the promise of the new heart is for all. 
who would receive it. And he tells them, it's pretty simple, choose life. He's admonishing and telling them to choose life. And when you look at the situation in the world, which the situation in the world, by the way, is a result of the situation that's in all of the human hearts that make up the world, right? So the problems, and we, and we can go out there and debate about politics, you know, if we put this control in and this control in, it's a problem in the human heart. Every problem begins there. It's a cultural problem because it's a sinful problem in all the individual's hearts that make up that culture. And that's the answer. The information the world needs, the hope they need is the gospel. But when you look at repentance, the promise of a new heart, it's available to everyone. What a solution. All people have to do is choose. All they have to do is choose. That's it. People have to choose. And they do choose. And they're accountable to the choice they make. And God is so merciful. He calls us to choose. He calls people to choose. He calls them to choose. And then he'll, tomorrow he'll call them to choose again. And he'll call them to choose. And he'll call them to choose. And he'll call them to choose. Because he's not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance and everlasting life. The gospel continues to go out. That's what needs to happen in the world now. It needs to go out. Why would someone choose death over evil? Good question. I'm, death over evil, did I say that? Death or evil, rather than life and good, verse 15. Pride, rebellion, lack of brokenness, lack of awareness of that need, uh, just a willful ignorance. A person won't accept for some reason. God's not against them, but they've bought that lie, been blinded. The reality is all mankind's on death row. Everybody is a prisoner to their sin. Everybody is on death row. Ever thought about that? That's scary. Don't know what day it will be, but everyone knows it's coming. Romans 3.23 says, For all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. Romans 6.23 says, For the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus our Lord. Romans 5.8, But God demonstrates his own love toward us, and that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. And Romans 10, which we looked at, verse 8 to 10, what does it say? The word is near you in your mouth and in your heart. That is the word of faith which we preach, that if you confess with your mouth and believe in your heart, you will be saved. Choose life over death. Choose blessing over cursing. Man, what stubbornness is in the heart, right? That man would actually choose to be blind and choose death and choose cursing. At boggles my mind. The stubbornness, the rebellion, it's so clear. Choose to remain cursed apart from God and all that he is. You know, Chuck Smith said this, and I really appreciate it. Man is not an agnostic because God can't be known. Man's not an agnostic because God can't be known. Man is is an agnostic because he chooses not to believe. God can be known. You know him. Here's a bunch of witnesses that say God can be known. And how hard was it for you to get to know him? Where did you have to go? What did you have to do? What did you have to sell? You know, or whatever. Like, you believe. And belief is a choice. It's a choice. Belief is a choice. It's right there. In your mouth, in your heart. Unbelief is also a choice. And mankind will be condemned because of their unbelief. Because light comes into the world and men love darkness rather than light. They choose not to receive his free gift. So, man can choose to believe in Jesus. Or man can choose to not believe in Jesus. Man can choose to believe in his resurrection. Or someone can choose not to believe in his resurrection. Oh no, what happened instead was, you know, the, they gave him some sort of special chemical and he swooned and then they, they took him down from the cross and they wrapped him up and then they put another body in its place and then they took Jesus' body and they ran away with it and they hit him off somewhere and they all had this plot from beforehand, all the disciples, you know, except Judas. And they all said, we'll die for this plan. This is a great plan. 
you know. And then they, you know, woke him up later and said, okay, now go present yourself, you know. And then Jesus played along with the game or whatever, and they slipped past all the guards, by the way, and all the Roman legions and escorts and all these things, and they healed up his wound when he was stabbed and water and blood came out and all that stuff, you know. He didn't really die. There's no other theories really than that theory. I mean, people come up with these ideas, but they just want to believe this insanity. And then they all died except for John for their faith. You know, they tried to kill him, but they're all martyred, excuse me. They're all martyred and they would die for this upon punishment upon death to keep this ruse going. You know, these things people come up with, they're smoke screens for a willful heart. They want to believe in evolution. They want to believe in something other than God because they don't want to be accountable to God. But it's good to be accountable to God. We need it, right? Look at the world. Um, again, man is an agnostic or atheist or whatever because that's what they choose. It's a choice. And, and someone can choose to believe in Jesus and someone can choose not to believe in Jesus. They can choose to believe in the resurrection or they can choose not to believe in the resurrection. It's their choice. It's their choice. And, and God foreknew everyone's choice, but that doesn't mean he made everyone's choice. He just foreknew your choice. Of course he foreknew your choice. It's God. He's omniscient. But he didn't make you choose what you chose, and he didn't make the devil choose what he chose, and he didn't make Hitler chose what he chose, or anybody else. You're accountable for your choice, and you know it in your heart. And so is everyone. 